Chapter 14 Planetary Influences Upon the Tatvas We have heretofore considered the regular, normal order of the solar and lunar currents of prana, and it should be clearly understood by this time that the tatvic state of these currents is a most important factor in determining the beneficial effects upon the whole physical being of their even, balanced flow in deep, full rhythmical breathing. The paramount influence affecting this comes from the planets, every one of which establishes its own currents in the organism, determined in degree and kind by the planet's position in the firmament and consequent relation with all other planets. It is the strength of these currents, varying in different people, which distinguishes the individualized, local prana from the universal terrestrial prana. In this fact, we find cooperation of all that astrology claims concerning the planetary influences at the moment of birth upon human life and character. There are seven descriptions of life currents, corresponding exactly with the planets of the solar system and influenced by them, which flow around the spinal chakras, every chakra being itself, in the activities therein centered. A miniature copy of the zodiac with divisions of influence corresponding to its heavenly signs. Several of these currents, or even all, may be passing along at the same time over the same nerve and around the same chakra, just as varying electric currents pass simultaneously over the same wire. The multitudinous fibers in a single nerve prevent any interference but every tattva will be more active in certain divisions of the chakra according to the position in the zodiac of the planetary influence. For the vibrations of the microcosm correspond with those of the macrocosm. These seven variations are all to be understood as tattvic modifications of prana, and they would flow on forever and a within the body as without in indisturbed harmony when nature is serene and affected by her storms only when in planetary or tatvic sympathy with them, but for the erratic working of human free will. As already stated many times, all disease is the result of disturbances in the regular balance of the positive and negative, or solar and lunar, currents of prana, and of the normal flow of the tatvas, and human errors, emotions, and deeds are the most common disturbing factors. But the changes thus injected into the localized, or individualized, prana prove to us as nothing else can the dynamic power of thought, itself manipulating and disturbing these forces and therefore superior to them, and disclose to the spiritually alive soul glimpses of limitless realms for conquest. To the materialist these realms of power are a sealed book, and will forever remain beyond his vision. He is the victim of self-limitation. They are accessible only to the soul-directed will, which, governing thought, chooses the right path and carries consciousness to higher planes of harmonic vibrations. The human instrument is thus tuned to purer and higher influences. An ocean of thought vibrations is beating upon our brains every instant, seeking sympathetic vibrations upon which to impinge. This is the secret of the same thought flashing through many brains under the same tattvic influence at the same time. While this tattvic, or planetary, influence determines the thoughts and the deeds of the drifters and all in negative, that is, receptive conditions, ours is the power to choose the thought. The free will that is a peril is also the greatest blessing, putting in our grasp the ever-ready means to overcome physical evils and the needs of the hour are ethical training in choice, and the education of the will. Evil seeks evil with a marvellous power of accretion and disturbance, but think not for a moment that all good is not even more powerful. The one corresponds to darkness, the other to light, the one is disintegrating, the other upbuilding and renewing. There is in things evil an element of self-destruction, in the operation of which lies the safety of the universe. The Perfect Way, page 189. Thus the tattvic state of Purdna in every human being is determined by the position and strength of the various local currents.
Color in different plexuses varies from moment to moment as the tattvic currents change and according to the flow of the pranic current, the state of which positive or negative modifies the prevalent color. The negative current of prana is said to be pure white, and the positive is tinged with red, sometimes described as rose color. This agrees perfectly with the color of the nerves, the sensory, afferent and posterior, which are the negative ones, being bluish white, and the motor, efferent and anterior, are reddish gray. The prevalent tattva injects its particular hue, when by any act of ours one or more of these tattvas is abnormally stimulated as in states of excitement, anger, hatred, jealousy, or depression and manifold worries, it not merely upsets the balance of the prevalent tattvic currents of the moment, but the disorder is stamped upon the current of the hour, and it passes on into the vast spaces of the universe to return again and again with varying degrees of force AC cording as the planets return to positions and relations one to another approximating the conditions at the time of the original disturbance. All the misery in the world is primarily due to foul magnetisms, which are evil vibrations of tremendously penetrative and compelling power, generated by wrong and impure thoughts and by fear, and constantly feared by the crimes of the depraved and the sins of the weak. The world has grown old trying to punish crime out of existence, but it can never be lessened till the leaven of spiritual thought reaches the masses and the basic truth, that wholesome, joyful thinking makes healthy, happy people is universally known. It is possible to gain such power over the pranic currents through perfect concentration, right thinking held steadfastly to the desired end and careful attention to breathing correctly and rhythmically, as to put them in any tattvic state desired. And this frees one from all antagonistic influences, whether hereditary or the chance of birth, that is, planetary conditions at the moment. Neither the lunar day, nor the constellations, nor the solar day, nor planet, nor God, that is, force, have power to affect one who knows the tattvic law and applies it through habitual practice and right direction of thought and willpower. A human soul is more to God than any planet and all the creative powers of the universe work with and for the right. Throughout the universe we have the sevenfold division, and that the planets are closely related with this, having each a correspondence with plane and principle and element, with color and with tone, is so manifest to the occult student as to need no demonstration. We are so wanted to this sevenfold division in some of the common affairs of life as to accept it unquestioningly. Thus, the seven days of the week are named from the planets, not in haphazard fashion, but strictly in accordance with their movements hour by hour. A cardinal tenet of the earliest known principles of astrology was that every hour and every day is under the direct rule and influence of a planet and there is no record of a period when the nearer planets, from Saturn to Mercury, were not known and symbolized as in our era. Of these, the sun and moon, supposed by the Egyptians to circle round the earth, were recognized as paramount in influence upon it, and the others were dignified according to the periods of their orbits which were the gauge of their distance. The planet ruling the first hour names the day, and the succession begins with Saturn, the most distant, and takes the planets in their order, viz. Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sol, Venus, Mercury, and Luna. Thus, on Saturn's day Jupiter rules the second hour, Mars, the third, Sol, Sun, the fourth, Venus, the fifth, Mercury, the sixth, and Luna, the seventh. Every planet reigns the first hour of its own day, and the eighth, fifteenth, and twenty-second. Three repetitions carry us through the twenty-first hour. Saturn rules the twenty-second, Jupiter the twenty-third, and Mars the twenty-fourth, finishing the day. 
Then Sol rules the first hour of the succeeding day, which is Sunday. Called by the Romans Dies Dominica, or Lord's Day, the day of the Lord's Son. Some authorities count from the rising of the sun. But a very old work, Arcandum's Astrology, reckons this planetary rule of hours from midnight, which agrees with the modern reckoning of time. The orderly repetition brings Luna the moon in as ruler of the next day. Hence, Monday, Mars, French, Modi, Tuesday, Mercury, Wednesday, Jupiter, Saxon, four, Thursday, and Venus, Saxon, three, Friday. All of the Latin tongues preserve in the names for the days of the week their planetary origin. But the Saxon derivation of English nomenclature has in hours obscured it in part. All possibility that chance or pure arbitrary selection had any part in thus naming the days seems eliminated when we consider the double harmony ruling the order. The succession of the planets is not only from the slowest, Saturn, to the swift planetary influences 155 s, the moon, but also in the exact order of their distance from the earth, from the most remote to the nearest. In matters astrological it is this regular succession of the planets, hour by hour, that determines fortunate planetary hours for various acts and undertakings. They are not, however, the same for all persons, being modified in effect by the characteristics established at the nativity. It is interesting while on the subject, and piles up the authority for thus naming the days of the week and their order as we know them, to mention that the seven Hebrew words for the first seven cardinal numbers are all formed of one syllable that signifies a star, or fire or light, and another expressing its quality, and they follow strictly the above order beginning with Sunday as the first day of the week. This is conclusive evidence that at the earliest formation of that language the relation between the planets and the days of the week was recognized as a basic fact in nature. The characteristic influences of the several planets thus expressed in the Hebrew names agree perfectly with the attributes still commonly assigned them and as they are important in our further study, I give them here with the original uncorrupted form of the Hebrew numbers. 1. Ashed, Sol, all bountiful fire. 2. Ashnem, Luna, star of slumber, star of oracles. 3. Ashlesh, Mars, star of flame. 4. Arabo, Mercury, star of activity. 5. Chemash, Jupiter, star of warmth, star of joy. 6. Ashish, Venus, star of existence. 7. Ashibo, Saturn, star of old age, and signifying also the end and the beginning. In further consideration of planetary influences, there seem to be convincing reasons for observing scrupulously this natural order of the planets in time and space the only one which satisfies my mind as in harmony with the Tatvik law. Confronted with the problem of harmonizing these, it was for a time bewildering to find how many tables of planetary correspondencies with color, number, metals, elements, and days had been devised in which the natural sequence of the planets is constantly violated, and the days of the week are thrown into utter confusion. Monday following Tuesday and Saturday, Wednesday. There is but one solitary anchor of agreement upon these planetary correspondencies between the various tables, religious, occult, astrological, and astronomical, with but one exception, to my knowledge, all connect Mars with fire, heat and passion, and the strife that leads to armed contest. Hence, he was called the god of war. We shall weigh the authority of some of these tables when we study in their turn color and number in greater detail. Our immediate interest now is with the Tatvik correspondencies which subject their activities, that is, their vibrations in physical organisms to planetary influences. The Shwagam, which is the Sanskrit authority for most of our knowledge concerning the Tatvik law, 
gives two sets of tattvic values or correspondencies for the planets, which at the outset is bewildering and unsatisfactory. There is but the slightest agreement between the two, and upon examination the logical mind rejects both as equally arbitrary and capricious, and seeks for a satisfactory hypothesis upon which to base the law of correspondencies. We ask ourselves, how do the planets differ one from another in elementary substances, and how are the tatvas differentiated? In the evolution of the latter, see chapter 5, we know that the bowl in which all are mixed is the most sublimated, and that they increase in density as they descend to prophevi, the activities of which tend to cohesiveness and compactness. This brings us immediately to the question, are not the planets differentiated in the same way, and is not their density determined in like manner, or by the variation in the proportions of the tatvas? If so, which is the most ethereal? Fortunately, modern science has arrived at very definite conclusions upon this subject of the density of the planets. A triumph of mathematics, that wonderful science on the wings of which the most severely materialistic mind fares forth into the invisible and brings back irrefutable data. When we group the planets in the astronomical order of their density, we find that it increases in an almost regular progression from Saturn to Mercury, which harmonizes perfectly in sequence with the age-honored order of the hour-by-hour -hour rule. That is, from the most distant to the nearest. The remote planets Uranus, Herschel, and Neptune, pronounced by occultists to be outside our system, do not come within the relations we are considering. They were unknown and invisible to the ancient world, both discovered within the last century and a quarter, 1781 to 1846, respectively. Their influence upon Earth life as yet is very slight, but they are heralds of coming changes. Dropping out of this planetary sequence, temporarily, during our search for tattvic correspondencies, the Sun and Moon, lords respectively of the positive and negative currents of prana, we are reminded that the Earth upon which we live is also a planet and has its place in this progression of density and we find it between Venus and Mercury. But in her orbital distance from the Sun, the Earth's place in the sequence is between Venus and Mars. Remember this, for it will be found to explain a seeming tattvic irregularity. I do not expect those readers who have merely read these lessons so far, and have neither practiced nor studied, therefore do not know one tattva from another or recall their distinguishing characteristics to grasp the significance of the above established facts. It is not mere phenomena we are seeking, but absolute truth, and those who are beginning to know the separate tattvas by their fixed activities and relations and invariable effects must already understand their logical correspondencies with the planets. Here is the opportunity to do some serious thinking. All interested students should meditate upon the subject and see how near they can come to a correct solution of the problem before reading the next chapter. It is necessary to give extreme emphasis to the fact that these lessons are neither mere speculations nor simply disclosures of curious mysteries. They are the first attempt to explain, in so practical a manner as to apply to every human need, the basic truths as far as human intelligence has yet unraveled them, concerning the vital force in human organisms, and their value is that they teach a thoroughly scientific method of personal training to obtain control of body and mind, and make them the perfect vehicles for the soul's expression that the Creator intended. Only by means of constant and regular practice of the breathing exercises and of concentration can these benefits be gained. In concentration, the mind is gradually attuned to those cosmic influences which in their very nature are antagonistic to the evil material inclinations that are hazards to physical health and check our evolutionary progress. It is through the ability to control prana and center it wherever we desire that we build the ladder to perfect centralization. 
a state of pure concentration which is lofty aspiration and, releasing the soul from its physical chains, places it upon its own throne and discloses to it the realms of knowledge and power to which it has access. Chapter 15 The Activities of the Macrocosm in the Microcosm The new science declares confidently that we are akin to the stars, meaning thereby that, being composed of like elements though in vastly different states, we have through countless ages evolved therefrom. Yet it would cut us off entirely from that influence now. And this is the great stumbling block of progress. When science goes further and recognizes that mankind, as also every living creature and every visible, material thing, is ever in the making and has never been severed from that original kinship, humanity will gain an immense impetus in the upward ascent of the evolutionary spiral towards the development of spiritual senses. The X-ray foreshadows the powers humanity will thus gain. Fortunately, recent discoveries are fast undermining the walls between the visible and invisible that materialism has with such blind zeal endeavored to render impregnable. It is of vast significance to have discovered that the chemistry of all parts of space is the same. The factor which they leave out of all their calculations and investigations is the life movement of the spirit through the rhythm of things. This is the energy within energy behind all phenomena, the soul of every atom, an energy of which we are a part, and of which we use whatever we will. That is, whatever we fit ourselves for through training of will and desire and thought. Of stupendous import to the race is it to study present stellar influences, realizing that the most distant star that lights the midnight canopy has its not insignificant part to play in the cosmic whole, just as every atom and molecule in the physical body has its use and connection with that whole. All phenomena, atmospheric, terrene, physical, or mental, may be traced to cosmic energies a part of which we are. Every point in the macrocosm is a center of action and reaction for the whole ocean of prana, and every one of these centers has its own atmosphere with its special limit. Rama Prasad says they might be called solar atoms. They are of various classes according to the prevalence of one or more of the constituent tattvas. And yet further, every atom has, therefore, for its constituents, all the four tatvas, in varying proportions according to its position in respect of others. The different classes of these solar atoms appear on the terrestrial plane as the various elements of chemistry. These points, the most infinitesimal units of time as of space, are called trutis in Sanskrit, and lacking a word to so clearly identify the thing. I shall use it. To understand the ceaseless play of vibratory rays emanating from the celestial workshops, meeting and crossing or impinging upon one another on varying planes, imagine, if you can, the spectacle presented if seven or more particles of radium could be so placed and displayed in a darkened room that you could see the crisscrossing of their brilliant rays in a bewildering maze. At every intersection of rays there would be a trottle receiving those rays, but no two trutists could possibly receive precisely the same vibrations, for not only are there three kinds of rays to move at varying tangents, but the trutists would vary in plane and also in distance from the centers. Just such streams of influence are beating upon us all the time. In this zone of earth life, Every trottle of the ecliptical space is an individual organism whose life phases change with the momentary variations of the tatvic vibrations as the Earth and her sister planets whirl in their orbits. Man is a microcosmic sphere of energy exactly duplicating or reflecting the macrocosmic sphere, of which he is as it were a single cell, made up of millions of atoms held together by vibratory law. Just as no two trutists can be exactly alike, so no two human beings are, for the unceasing play of the tatvas is a constant mingling and changing under the ebb and flow of the great breath.
which holds all the planets and constellations in their assigned orbits. Thus the Tattvas are the forces that lie at the root of all manifestations. They are that which lies behind every natural phenomenon. But it is only when the Tattvas reach a certain state of density that they become visible. The sun, stars, and planets are the visible, materialized centers of invisible, spiritual and ethereal forces. So spiritual vision, no matter, is dense. It should be remembered that no two planets move with the same velocity or in the same orbit, and that consequently their aspects one to another are incessantly changing. The varying forms of tattvic force and influence cause this, and it is the reaction from the planets which injects such variation in the pranic currents flowing earthward. And, in consequence, into every species of earth organism these organisms being, as you will remember, manifestations on the gross, that is, visible, plane of tattvic activities. Astronomers have recognized that the mutual interaction between the planets is a never-ending source of perturbations and disturbances, now checking and diverting, now restraining and now accelerating each and every one in its orbit, so that their paths through the conjuries of stars which form the constellations, though never diverging far from the ecliptic, are most devious being marked by eccentric loops and kinks recoiling upon their celestial pathways. Size and weight or velocity of motion, and especially their position in relation to the sun have been the factors supposed to account for the influences and antagonisms driving these stellar lords to so erratic conduct. That the antagonism was in substance, a question of chemical affinity or repulsion shall we not say of electrical condition seems never to have occurred to investigators. But when we apply the tattvic law to the problem, there is the most logical basis to believe that it solves the enigma, accounting for all vagaries and idiosyncrasies, and for the known influences of one planet upon another. Let us begin with Saturn. By our law of correspondences, it seems a simple matter to recognize that this most masterful and significant of the major planets is the center of Akashic influence, and derives from the predominance of this tattva all the malefic influences which the astrologer attributes to the great in fortune. The rays of light thus thrown upon the subject dissipate a cloud of mystery and make clear hitherto unexplainable phenomena as also many a legend and story of old. Both Saturn and Jupiter are said to present only a surface of clouds, and may not have anything solid about them. But it is suspected that they have a high temperature. Some states of Actia are known to be marked by an extraordinarily high temperature, and a surface of cloud is what we should naturally expect. Even to the naked eye Saturn gleams with a cold blue light. Seen through a five-inch telescope, the planet appears of a cool silver-white color, with delicate grayish shadings, blending one with another as they stretch from the bright equatorial belt to the deep blue poles. These polar caps are sometimes described as of a dark greenish hue, but the great dissimilarity in human optics would account for this discrepancy, as also would changing Tatvul J conditions. An interesting feature is that the planet is banded by vari colored belts, red, orange, and sometimes delicate rose color. They are, however, less brilliant than Jupiter's belts and not recognized as so variable. But the greatest distinction of Saturn, the phenomenon that puzzles the scientists the most, is its remarkable system of rings, separate from the planet and surrounding its equatorial belt. There are two broad, bright bands, separated from each other by a black line, indigo, which line marks a 1,600-mile gap, and a third dusky inner ring which is only faintly luminous and so transparent that the edge of the planet can be seen through its mass. The space between them has been measured, and it is estimated to be from 9 to 10,000 miles broad. The inner and outer rings are over 10,000 miles in width, and the middle one is more than a third broader, 
being 16,500 miles wide. To the knower of the Tatvas, the only possible hypothesis is that these rings are Tatvic emanations from the mother bowl of Arkasha, and their peculiarities so far as known perfectly agree with their natural identification. Thus, the gauzy, crepe inner ring is Fayu, Gare. Whence emerges the brightest and broadest ring, Tejas. The expansive nature of this tattva explains its greater width, and the qualities of light and heat and its characteristic color, its superior brilliancy. The outer ring appears to be Prathivi. Color and volume corroborate this suggestion, while in the midnight gap that separates it from Tejas, Akasha must hold apers, water, in a latent state. This order of visibility corresponds perfectly with the planetary sequence, and also with the changes of the Tatvas in the currents of prana within our bodies, as described in Chapter 13, where your attention was attracted to the peculiarity that the order of evolution, see Chapter 5, was violated. I am satisfied that we find in the planetary sequence the explanation for this and the famous rings of Saturn corroborate the belief. No other planets have rings, only from Arkasha could they emanate. Saturn's rings are the girdle with which Satan alone among the gods is girt about. For Satan is the sole and spiritual ruler of Saturn. His kingdom is the house of matter. Evil is the result of limitation, and Satan is the lord of limit. See perfect way. Page 369. Remember that through Arkasha spirit descended into matter. Ancient myths represent Saturn as devouring his children, which symbolizes exactly what the Akashic Tattva does with every other Tattva. Ages before Christ, all the lesser celestial bodies were regarded as Saturn's children. The Hebrews had several names for Saturn, but as Sata, or Sita, the attributes conferred upon him will be recognized as symbolizing perfectly the qualities or powers of Akasha. He was called the god of secrecy, parent of successive being, and author of generation. It was believed that Sata consumed all things and again repaired them. Men were in closer touch in those days with matters celestial to have felt the mysterious influences of all these things which it is our privilege to understand rationally as inherent in the power of one of the centers from which the life we live is flowing constantly to us. Saturn's influence tends to fix more deeply that of other planets. He rules the east wind which, moving contrary to the earth's motion, conduces greatly to dampness and depletes the electricity in the atmosphere. This is one reason why the east wind gets onto people's nerves. They are failing to receive the normal supply, but the remedy is to generate it within. Fear has always been recognized as the active expression of the Saturn principle, and certainly nothing more is needed to identify the Akosha influence. Now the soul and life of the whole solar system is the solar orb, and the human soul is as a spirit UL sun, corresponding in all things with the solar orb. If it permits evil to exist in its sphere, the microcosm that evil will attract corresponding astral influences from the macrocosm. Disturbing influences can thus, of course, enter the body as the tatvas change in their normal course. But thought has the power either to subdue them when they appear or to repel them before they find entrance, through holding tenaciously thoughts of serene confidence. Imagination is the architect, and thought the builder. We must have a perfect plan and use good materials if we would protect our bodies from the external disturbing thought influences to which every organ is more or less sensitive. Its receptivity depends upon us. Excessive indulgence in the gratification of an especial sense pleasure tends to exaggerate the Fiyotatva ruling that sense to an unwholesome degree. Thus the intensifying of one color may be the extinction of others, and at least casts an evil shade upon them. And this, of course, affects the whole current of prana, disturbing the Tatva J balance. Many diseases, petty and grave, 
result from no other cause. The fact must never be lost sight of that spiritual energy differs from physical energy almost as much as does light from darkness. It is not dependent upon these celestial currents of ether which carry the renewing elements of physical matter, but is itself one with that even more subtle force that permits them to manifest on the gross, visible plane. It is the only unchangeable principle within us, the real substance which never disintegrates, the power to control the physical self and make of it the perfect vehicle it is intended to be for the growth and development of this spiritual self, is gained more rapidly by persistent and regular practice of the alternate and held breath exercises, and by thoughtful attention from time to time to deep rhythmic breathing, than by any other system of discipline and study or therapeutic regime that I know of. I have already advocated this so earnestly and so repeatedly that further word or explanation seems superfluous. Exhaustion is due entirely to the disordered state of the human battery, and in this condition all organic functions are lowered in tone and quickly reflect that disorder. Neither lungs, skin, nor kidneys have sufficient energy to eliminate the rapidly accumulating wastes. Hence vital centers become clogged, and serious disease sets in wherever the physical structure is weakest. The first need at such times is to renew the battery and restore the balance of the disordered currents of vital force. And the media for doing this breathing exercises is so simple, so easy to apply, that the most helpless invalid, if the mind be sane and capable of directing, can employ it for regenerating the whole being. Both nerve and blood circulation and thereby all functions are stimulated more by this method than by any possible physical culture exercises. And here a caution is timely. There is a vast difference in attempting to exercise healing power from without, as when denying disease and pain, and working from within outward in affirmation of the desired condition. The resulting atomic vibrations and the potencies involved are very different. The one is a species of constraint, the other is free, upward guidance. We must strive for poise and tranquility, for repose and confidence, which, manifesting themselves in good colors favorable tattva draw good and pure colors, and help to build purer and stronger the life thus aiming for the highest and the best.